Romans chapter 4. We're going to begin reading this morning at verse 1. Romans chapter 4. I invite you to stand with me as you're able to and honor the reading of God's word. Romans 4, verses 1 through 8. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes in, on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. You may be seated. A few years ago, back in 1512, some of y'all remember? I don't either. In 1512, a young man who had these deep religious convictions, serving as a professor, the University of Wittenberg. He had entered the monastery of the Roman Catholic Church to become a monk. And his assignment in 1512 was to teach in the university. The day came when he was actually sent to Rome to transact some business with the Pope. And he joyfully began his journey to Rome believed the church was supreme. He believed that the Pope in his office was the incarnation of infallibility. When he arrived in Rome, he found such corruption in the church that he became very deeply troubled. And his faith in an infallible church was shaken. He himself felt sinful for even having these thoughts about the church. So he made his way to the cathedral. He began climbing the Scala Sancta, the, the sacred stairs, and as he climbed the stairs, he stopped as was the custom and, and kissed each individual step. In a few minutes, he began to hear a verse of scripture in his mind. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. That verse of scripture kept, kept running through his mind over and over again. And after much consideration and and, and agonizing prayer, Martin Luther renounced the Roman Catholic Church and he began preaching the doctrine of justification. He would preach, the just shall live by faith. Not by works, not by penance, but by faith. This is the same doctrine that Paul had preached many centuries before. But it had become lost in a maze of, of, of mystic, mysticism and 
and ceremonial religion. But now, the doctrine began to come alive again. And out of Martin Luther's experience grew the Reformation, Protestantism. I want us to consider this morning that word just. Just. Justified. Justification. What is justification? Justification is the act whereby God declares sinners just. He declares sinners innocent. As if they'd never sin before. In our day of, of 24 hour news and court TV and Judge Judy, does she still do her thing? But I'm sure there are other judges who have taken her place if she doesn't. In this day, we might, we might better phrase this as an acquittal. Justification is an acquittal. It's more than a pardon. See, a pardon frees people merely from the penalty of their crime. And as, as sinners, it would free us from the penalty of sin. But it doesn't free us from the guilt. Pardon doesn't free us from the guilt, rather acquittal. Justification does. That's good news, folks. Justification takes away all the guilt, all the blame, entirely. Justification is the process which brings us into a right relationship with God. As a perfect God faced sinful mankind, there was a problem. In the Old Testament, the principle of justice had been laid down. In Deuteronomy 25.1, we read, When a man or when men have a dispute, they are to take it to court and the judges will decide the case, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. So by this principle, God himself administers justice. See, he could not go against his own command that justice be served. But how could God be just and at the same time acquit the ungodly, the sinful? Now, Paul stated the problem in Romans 3.23 for all, all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God. This judgment is passed on the whole human race. We're all sinners. When God then sits in his place of judgment to dispense justice. He has to pronounce the whole world guilty. We're all guilty. But how could he save anyone? If that's the case. How could he re receive sinners into his presence at all? And so the, the question before us becomes, how are people justified? How are people justified? Well, let's approach it from the negative, first of all. See, we're not justified by good deeds. If you flip back to the previous page, uh, maybe on the same page for your in your Bible, but... Romans 3, beginning at verse 23. I want to read a few of these verses. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time 
His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. A person can look at life and they may, they may see that they're living the best moral life they could possibly live. We could sell everything we have. Give the money to the church or to the poor or to some other charitable cause. We may do unto others as we'd have them do unto us, but still fall short of what God requires. And this is what Paul meant when he, when he wrote to the Ephesians, for it is by Grace, not works, not living a moral life, not giving, not treating others well. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, a gift of God, not of works. No one can boast about that. Paul is very clear. We're not justified by our good deeds, but we're also not justified by performing religious duties. We can pray, we can join the church, we can be baptized, we can attend regularly, we can give our tithes, we can give above and beyond our tithes, we can receive the Lord's Supper and still be lost. See, these are all religious acts. They're important. They're commendable. But they must be an outgrowth of an experience of a person who's already been justified. A saved person. It's difficult for people to understand salvation costs them nothing. They can't earn it. They can't buy it. When we say salvation is free, we're not saying that salvation costs nothing, but it costs us nothing. In fact, it costs God, His only begotten Son. It costs Jesus, His, His perfect, sinless life. We deserve death. Jesus took on humanity. He took our place before God. He took upon Himself the penalty of the law we had broken. You and I deserve death. We deserve the penalty of our sins. But because of the love of God, we got grace instead. We got grace and forgiveness. All because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Because of God's great love. It cost you and me absolutely nothing, but in a sense, it cost us everything. Here's what I mean it's not enough to believe. We believe. Yeah, that, that, I, I, that makes sense. Um, I get that. I believe in God, so this, this makes sense. That's not the kind of belief that we are to have in the Lord Jesus. By faith, trusting Him as Lord of our lives, as the one in complete command, second to none, Salvation is a free gift. We must accept it. It's not ours until we repent and trust Him as Lord. And that's how we receive this free gift. It means that we've surrendered ourselves completely to Him. 100%. I hope you've done that today. If you haven't, you'll have an opportunity to in a few moments.
First of all, I want us to consider how does justification work? How does it work? Well, we need to recognize that it's an instantaneous act. The moment that we surrender our hearts to Jesus Christ, we're justified. We're forgiven. We're acquitted of the guilt of our sins. Now, justification is not a progressive act. Not like the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes convicting of our sins is a, a pro process. Sometimes it involves a period of time, a chain of circumstances, depending on the individual. Not so with justification. Think about this. If a judge in a courtroom says to a defendant, I declare you innocent of the crime with which you've been charged, does that judge then send the defendant back into prison to stay there and wait for some later date that they might be released? No. When you're declared innocent, you're innocent, you're free. You're acquitted. Immediately. Justification is an instantaneous act. It's also an irreversible act. The law today, we have, we have a concept of a double jeopardy. In other words, we cannot hold a person in jeopardy for the same crime for which they have already been acquitted. A woman kills someone in self-defense. The jury acquits her of the crime, frees her from all guilt, and never again can she be charged with that same crime involving the same person. So it is when God justifies us. No one can reverse the act of, of justification. You and I can praise God today. That we don't have to ever fear being held accountable for sin which God has already acquitted us for. Here's more good news. What are the blessings of justification? What are the blessings of justification? First, justification brings full and free pardon from God. Complete Forgiveness. Pardon that covers all sin, past, present, and future. God doesn't save us on an installment plan. He saves us completely. When we come to Him through Christ, we're His. We're justified eternally. The consequences of sin that we commit later... We will suffer. Usually in this life, we will suffer the consequences of that sin. But the penalty of that sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus cleanses us, frees us from all sin. Secondly, justification produces a perfect standing with God. The sin has marred our relationship with Almighty God. But through justification, we stand clean. We stand blameless before Him. When God looked at people in the light of His law, He saw the black of sin that produced hopeless condemnation. But when He looks at believers today through the blood of Jesus... He sees us as cleansed from our sins. He sees us as eternally righteous. That's good news, folks. More good news. Justification brings peace with God. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Paul further describes this peace as a peace that passes all understanding. Peace that passes all understanding. I know very few people in this world who don't want peace. I know some, a few sick individuals who, who, who thrive on, on confrontation. Who never have peace. But I believe the majority of human beings in this world want peace. And they prefer peace to unrest. For a person to have peace in his or her heart. To have peace in his or her home. It's an almost indescribable joy. Peace like that can only be possible when we've been justified by faith in Christ. So if you don't know the peace of God, the kind of peace that passes all understanding, you can experience it today by coming to Christ. I'm told that the city of Venice is a, a beautiful city of waterways. And over one canal in Venice is a bridge called the Bridge of Sighs. S-I-G-H-S. Sighs. The Bridge of Sighs. Here's why it's called the Bridge of Sighs. It leads directly from a courtroom to a dismal prison where guilty criminals are left to rot and die. And over the door Going into that prison are these words. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. Imagine for a moment a convicted man crossing that bridge. He's already kissed his family, his loved ones for the last time. He's enjoying the last view of sunlight that he'll ever know. His heart filled with grief, remorse, despair. And as he's about to step through the door under which those words are written, abandon hope all ye who enter here. Someone comes running out from the courtroom. It's a court attendant. This attendant cries out, Halt! I have here an acquittal for you. You're free to go. Can you imagine the overwhelming joy this man would experience? His gratitude. His, his testimony to others based upon that moment. This is an illustration of what happens upon our repentance of sin and our faith in Jesus Christ. What a testimony we have. It doesn't matter where we've been or what we've done, how good or how bad we've been in the past. What matters is that we were condemned. But Jesus forgave us because He was willing to take on our sin on the cross. He provided a way for us to be acquitted completely by God. And once we're forgiven and justified, the stain of sin is forever removed. The question then remains, have you experienced the joy of knowing that you've received a divine acquittal? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Now, if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I want to invite you to come.
to receive that divine acquittal. Doesn't matter how bad you've been, where you've been, how good you've been. If you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, as your Lord, you stand condemned until such time that you place your faith in Him. You don't have to earn a thing. The price has already been paid. Christian, you need to rededicate your life, renew your commitment, you come. Maybe God wants you to serve in this church, be a part of this family of faith, you need to come. You need someone to pray with you, need to kneel at this altar and lift up someone in prayer, come. Don't put it off. Don't hesitate. Father, as your Holy Spirit continues to speak, may our actions honor you and your call upon our lives. Have your way now in this time of decision. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.